in recent days with the various things that our country is facing and sometimes what we perceive as challenges to our very freedoms. I have been convicted by God that I feel like that we need to rediscover our history. We need to revisit our history and we need to redefine and understand the concepts upon which this nation was built that made it a great nation. It is every generation's responsibility to teach our children and our grandchildren about history and about God's work in the midst of that history. And as your pastor, I want to spur you on as parents or grandparents to be teaching your children and your grandchildren about the history of America, about how we were formed and the hearts and thoughts of our forefathers. Something that we will remember beyond just the history classes we took in high school or college. I really believe that God wants us to focus on that. So we're beginning today a seven-part series called One Nation Under God. One Nation Under God. We're starting here on Memorial Day, and we will finish it the weekend of the 4th of July. And those seven Sundays, we're going to be focusing on some aspect of our history and about the founding of our country and the concepts and truths that are vital and were vital in those days. I'm going to share with you some documents that you probably remember, documents that we'll put up on the screen for you, documents like, um, what would be the first one? Mayflower Compact. Do you all have that up there? The Mayflower Compact. Do you all remember studying about that? Are the Declaration of Independence, are the Articles of the Confederation, are the Constitution of the United States of America, are the Bill of Rights, those first ten amendments to the Constitution, are something we call the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag. We'll be looking at those various documents and those things and how precious they are to our country. But today we're beginning by remembering. It is Memorial Day weekend, a time to remember. Today's message is entitled, A Nation Worth Dying For. A Nation Worth Dying For. Because Memorial Day is the time we focus on those who have given their lives for our country. Now that video, The Purple Heart, as well as the song that the choir just sung helped to set the tone for this message. But I've invited a dear friend of our family, actually some of our kinfolk, and the fact that their son is married to my daughter. I asked Debbie Walters, I pastored her whenever we were in Enterprise, Alabama, and I heard her tell this story. And I asked her if she would come today and share a very special story with you on Memorial Day. Debbie, come. Is forgotten. <coughs> Memorial Day is a day of remembrance, a day to honor those military heroes who have died, a day of patriotism, a love of country, and a love of God. I have been asked to tell the story of one hero. His story is not, new, not unique. Since the birth of our nation, over 1.2 million men and women have given their lives in the service of their country. The date, August the 20th, 1964. Place, Ben Trey in the province of Benoit in the heart of the Mekong Delta, South Vietnam. A 24-year-old lieutenant and three other American soldiers serving as U.S. Special Forces advisors were with the 41st Vietnamese Ranger Battalion. An emergency call had come in that an outpost in surrounding villages were under attack by the Viet Cong. 
They answered the call, the mission was successful, and they defended the area. Little did they know what was going to occur next. On the way back to their post, they were ambushed. Under intense fire, the lieutenant called for artillery and for air support. He then took charge of the ground forces. Although vastly outnumbered, four Americans and 360 Vietnamese Rangers and infantry against some 800 Viet Cong. They were able to withstand three direct assaults. Lieutenant Reagan and the other three delivered accurate fire to counter the enemy assaults those three times. The ambush was characterized by constant charges, bayonets used hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Vietnamese unit eventually collapsed. Most of the surviving Vietnamese troops withdrew knowing that they could not withstand a fourth assault. Despite their hopeless situation, the four Americans and those Vietnamese that chose to stay stood firm. They refused to retreat. They continued fighting. Three of the Americans were mortally wounded. Eyewitness accounts from those Vietnamese who stayed and survived recounted, recounted that Lieutenant Reagan was the last American seen standing, firing his machine gun into the fourth and final assault. This was reported by Lieutenant General William J. McCaffrey, who later served as deputy commander to all of the U.S. Army forces in Vietnam, to Reagan's parents and his family. His sacrifice of his life enabled the remaining Vietnamese unit to withdraw. That day left Lieutenant Reagan, along with the three other American advisors, and over 200 Vietnamese dead. Peter Arnett, an AP war correspondent, described, this was the 60 bloodiest minutes of fighting in Vietnam so far. It actually lasted one hour and 40 minutes. This battle was in the front, on the front page of the New York Times that week. William David Hauser Reagan was ranked, was given the rank of captain, has a housing area in Fort Benning, Georgia, named after him, has an armory named in his honor in his hometown of Palatka, Florida, received the Distinguished Service Cross, second highest award given, uh, given along with the three other Americans, the Army Commendation Medal with V for Valor, the Purple Heart, with an oak leaf cluster, the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry, and others. His picture and his medals are hanging in the library at the Citadel, where he graduated. He left a wife, Mrs. Patty McCaffrey Reagan, a two-year-old daughter, Beth, a daughter, Lisa, 11 months old, who unexpectedly died and was buried one month after her father's funeral at his feet on a, on a hill overlooking all those white tombstones that you saw in the film just a second ago near the tomb of the unknown soldier in Arlington National Cemetery. Captain William David Hauser Reagan is a hero and he is my brother. Six years later, my 21-year-old husband, Larry, an assault helicopter pilot, was also sent to Ben Trey in the Benoit province of South Vietnam. Larry came home, but he said he was there where my brother had served and died. Our son David served in the Iraqi war and is still serving proudly in the U.S. Army. In an article written in the VFW magazine just last August of 2014, there's an article there that's about three pages long about the bloodiest battle. 
But he wrote, this was his conclusion, although some would have us believe otherwise, Vietnam was a war with heroes. They died for the noblest of causes. They sacrificed their lives for the men next to them. Coyle, Reagan, Stone, and Ward were just among the first in a long line to do so in an advisory war that transformed into a full-fledged American war in 1965. I am proud of my brother, but what makes me even more proud and gives me comfort and makes me grateful is that my brother knew the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Amen. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. In that jungle, so very far away from home and family, my brother was there, but so was our God, our Father. He didn't protect my brother's body from the bullets, but he gave him strength and determination and courage to protect his men to the very last. And then our God walked my brother home. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, but I can assure you that my family remember daily, and I'm sure there are families in this room that have also lost their heroes, and you remember them daily. And families all across this nation remember theirs daily. We remember the sacrifices they made. I pray that you will take a few minutes tomorrow to remember the men and women who gave their lives for their country. I hope that you will thank active duty military and retirees for their service and continuing service. Just as freedom is not free, neither is freedom from sin free. This Memorial Day, please praise and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. His sacrifice for all men to be free should never be forgotten. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The last verse I want to say is, is what this is really all about. Psalms 115, 1, and I'm sorry. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for your love and your faithfulness. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Debbie. God bless you. And for all of you who have given of your family or friends in the, our freedom and preserving our freedom, if you're here and you had a family member or friend that you know who gave their life in the service of our country, would you stand? Would you stand wherever you are all across this? Just keep remain standing. Look around. And we thank you so very much. God bless you. We appreciate the sacrifice. God bless you. And Memorial Day is about a time to remember. If you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I want to read what Moses, as he is recalling the history of, of Israel and the journey they've had, along with preparing their hearts for what they're about to encounter as they're going to go into the Promised Land under the leadership of Joshua, he gives to them a word of instruction that is an important word. An important word for them as well as an important word for us. That's what it says in verse 7 of Deuteronomy 32. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of all generations. Ask your father and he will inform you. Your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High gave the nations their 
inheritance. You know what Moses said to the children of Israel? He said, this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to remember. You're going to have to remember the inheritance that God gives to you. And you need to ask your father, let your father tell you about what God did. And the elder's responsibility is to tell what God has done. And, and when it comes to that point of how God separated the nations and gave you to that inheritance, you need to always remember. For see, he was giving them instruction about what they were going to need to do in their lives and in their history. For they were about to enter into what was called the promised land. You remember that God had established this land. It was the Canaan land. And God had set that apart and said, this is the land that I promised to you. It's a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And, and I'm giving that land to you as a, permanent, as a permanent gift and a permanent place. This is what I am giving to you. Even though God gave it to them, though, it was under Joshua's leadership that they had to claim the land, didn't they? I mean, that was the land of the Canaanites. Whenever the Israelites showed up, did they just say, hey, God gave us this land, the Canaanites just evacuated. Is that what happened? No, they didn't evacuate. What did they have to do? They had to claim the land. They had to acquire the land. And you know what that meant? They had to go and they had to do battle for the land that God had given to them. You recall some of those battles whenever they went to, to the city of Jericho, and when they were at Jericho, and, and they had to go around the city, and what happened eventually, the walls came tumbling down. And they thought, well, our next battle will be easier than that because it's a little small city called Ai. But remember what had happened? Somebody had sinned in the camp, and they went and got defeated at Ai, and a number of their people were killed until they got their hearts right, and they went and they defeated Ai. And all through the book of Joshua, you find this story of where they're claiming the land and acquiring the land, and they're working for that land that God had given to them. You know what Moses said? Moses says, you need to remember that. You need to remember about those things that are going to happen. You need to remember about the inheritance that, that God's going to give to you. And you need to realize there was a price to be paid. Because see, whenever the children of Israel went in and they won that land, people died. It wasn't the fact they just walked in and nobody was hurt. They had people who died. People who paid the price for them to inherit that land, for them to get that land that God had given to them, for them to achieve the fact and acquire the land of the Canaanites, there was somebody who died. But you know what? They realized that there was a land worth dying for. Isn't that true? They realized that that land that God had given them, that land that was flowing with milk and honey, that land that God had said permanently would be theirs, was a land worth dying for. And some of them died and and never got to eat of the fruit of that land, never got to enjoy that land, it was going to be their posterity, it was going to be their children and their grandchildren who would have a chance to live in that land and enjoy that land and inherit that land. But they died and paid the price, but they knew that there was a land worth dying for. Well, fast forward in biblical history, and you come to the New Testament. The New Testament's ushered in with John the Baptist preaching, preparing the way for the Messiah, for Jesus to come. And Jesus was born just a few months after John. They both kind of grew up parallel together. And then John has a responsibility of saying, here comes the Messiah. And he keeps preaching about this coming Messiah until one day Jesus shows up and John looks at him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, recognizing him as the Messiah. Remember, Jesus was baptized by John that day. And John realized that this Messiah was the one who was the promised one, the one that they'd been waiting for. And Jesus begins his ministry. And what does Jesus do in that ministry? Well, he does all kinds of miracles to reveal that he is a child of God. He teaches the truth of God and he lives a life before man to reveal what God is like and what man was intended to be like. But also as he preached and as he taught, he revealed that, that there was sin in the world and sin in the hearts of men. And that all of us were sinners. We'd all missed the mark. And because of sin, we deserve to pay the price for sin. And the price for sin has always and will always be death. That death had to be paid because of sin. We all deserve to die. But Jesus told something else. He told them that 
he came for a purpose regarding that death, and that was that he was going to die on a cross and pay the price for sin. It, he wasn't dying for his own sin, for he had not sinned. He was going to die on a cross to pay the price for mankind's sin, and, and that if any person would believe that when he died on that cross, he died for their sin, they'd be forgiven of their sin. They wouldn't have to pay that price, but they could have everlasting life. And it was called the good news, or it was called the gospel. And that was good news, that Jesus Christ would pay the price for sin, and we would have the opportunity, mankind would have the opportunity that we might live and to live eternally. You know what Jesus revealed whenever he died on that cross? He, realized, he, he revealed that there were people worth dying for. Isn't that true? He, he revealed that people were worth dying for. Matter of fact, he revealed it individually that you as a person were worth dying for. I don't know how you feel today. You ought to feel good. You ought to feel good in the fact that Jesus Christ says this, that you are worth dying for. When we went to that cross and he died, he died for you. He died for you. And I don't know about you, I am glad that Jesus was willing to die for me. I'm glad that he considered that each and every one of us were worth dying for. And just as Moses said to the children of Israel, do not forget, you need to remember the price that was paid for the inheritance that God gave to you. Jesus said the same thing, didn't he? In that Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, Jesus said, and often as you partake of these elements, as often as you break this bread, and as often as you take of the fruit of the vine, that you would remember, that you would remember the sacrifice that I have made for you. Remember that I think, I believe, Jesus says, that you are worth dying for. Well... When Jesus was walking in this world, he didn't just walk alone. He called disciples to come and to walk with him. But not only disciples, he eventually chose 12 of those disciples to be his apostles. And to be apostles means that they were given the responsibility to carry out the purpose and the commission and the meaning of Jesus' ministry to expand the kingdom of God. I mean, Jesus was taking these 12 men and investing three years in their life. They saw those miracles. They heard what he said. They were taught by him, rebuked by him, and saw all the things. And not only that, they had the opportunity of seeing him be resurrected from the dead and, and to ascend to the Father. And they had the opportunity of being filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. All those things happened to those 12 men given the responsibility that they would share the gospel of Christ and share that good news that the whole world might have opportunity to hear and to respond to the message of the gospel. Those 12 men given that responsibility. And I hope you realize that the very fact that you're here today, and if you name the name of Christ, it is a testimony that they were successful. They were successful in what they did. They shared that gospel. They let that truth be known. They let the kingdom expand all the way to you. All the way to me. Boy, so many of us, when we think about those apostles, many of us will say in our conversation, Boy, I tell you, I wish I would have been one of those apostles. I, I wish I'd have had the opportunity to walk with Jesus. I'd like to have been able to see those miracles that Jesus did. I I'd like to have heard him teach personally. I, I wish I could have been one of those apostles. Oh, really? Oh, really? For see, out of those 12 apostles, one of those, of course, was Judas Iscariot. That left 11. Then, then Paul considered himself the apostle to fill in the gap, the 12th one. And Matthias was elected as well as by lot uh, there at the upper room before the day of Pentecost. If you want to take all 13 of those, every one of those died a martyr except John. And John didn't have an easy life because he was in exile on the Isle of Patmos, and that was no vacation spot. Every one of those died. Let me just remind you. 
Peter died in Rome. He was crucified, but he refused to be crucified like Jesus, so he asked them to crucify him upside down. Andrew, his brother, died in Greece, and he was crucified on an X cross, a cross that formed an X called Andrew's Cross. James died in Palestine. He was beheaded. As I told you, John died a natural death after being exiled on the Isle of Patmos. Matthew died in Ethiopia. He was impelled to the earth by spears and eventually beheaded. Nathaniel died in Armenia, and he was beaten to death. Literally, his flesh was torn from the bone. Thomas, doubting Thomas, died in India. And he was thrust through by spears and then burned with hot plates until he eventually was burned alive, all the while refusing to deny that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Philip was impaled by iron hooks in his ankles and hung upside down. James the Less died in Palestine. He was thrown from the temple, thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and eventually beaten and stoned. Simon the Zealot was crucified. Thaddeus died in Mesopotamia and he was literally beaten to death. And Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, was beheaded. So you still want to be one of those apostles? Why would I share that with you? Because, see, those apostles knew that there was a cause worth dying for. There was a cause worth dying for. The kingdom of God, sharing the gospel, letting the world know that Jesus saves. And they spread out throughout the known world at that time and shared that gospel and fulfilled that purpose and accomplished God's plan and died because they did so, but it was a cause worth dying for. Hmm. The Israelites felt like there was a land worth dying for. Jesus, there are people worth dying for. The apostles, there's a cause worth dying for. In the 1600s in Europe, America had already been founded by Christopher Columbus and others in the 1492 and years following that. But it wasn't until the 1600s in Europe that things got really difficult in the European countries. In the European countries, there was a lot of class warfare going on. If you were poor, you were always going to be poor, and there was no way to pull out of that. There was a lot of persecution that was going on, and a lot of economic problems that were taste facing those countries and those nations, especially in regard to worship and the freedom of religion. For many of those nations had established their own church, national churches, and you had to be a part of that national church or you would be persecuted and ridiculed. And for those who were followers of Christ and who had a desire to live and to worship the way they chose to worship, whether it be the Puritans or Separatists, or whoever it might be, they found themselves under persecution from those European nations. And things got so hard that they began to look for a way out. And the only way they could find a way out was there was a new world that had been discovered that would be the land, hopefully, of opportunity. And these people would gather on these boats that most of us would never consider cruising too far in, much less going all the way across the world. And they would put their families in these little small boats and they would travel across an ocean. An ocean that would take them two to three months to cross. So the next time you're in an airplane and you're complaining about how long it takes, just think how fortunate you are, how long it would cross the Atlantic Ocean. That's a long time, isn't it? But not only that, they were traveling across oceans and they had all kinds of perils on the sea. But whenever they got here, it was an unknown land, an unsettled place, a wilderness to move into, and had no idea what they would do, where they would be, and what life would bring to them. But from the very first of those settlements, whether it would be in Jamestown or on Plymouth Rock, those first settlements, they came with great hope. They came with the dreams of opportunity. And they came with the desire, desire that they might, 
that they might be able to worship freely, live freely, and to be successful. Well, for 150 to 175 years, they tried to live in that situation. But it came apparent to them and to the people who lived here that to them, for them to have total freedom, they were not going to be able to be colonies of the European countries for there was still that bondage. And a conviction came in their heart that this new world needed a new nation. And this gathering of people came together and began to make bold statements and bold decisions and write bold documents like the Declaration of Independence that says, we want to be free. And no more than the Canaanites picked up and moved out of their land when the Israelites showed up, neither did the European countries necessarily say that they were going to take hands off just because the American colonies wanted to be free. It meant it was going to cost something. And that freedom did cost something. And maintaining that freedom for these 200 plus years has always cost something. Whether it was the Revolutionary War that won the freedom and independence, or whether it was the Civil War that preserved this unity of this nation, or whether it was the world wars or the Korean conflict or Vietnamese war or Iraq or Afghanistan or terrorism today, all of those things to preserve the freedom of this nation. In every stage, there's been a price that had to be paid. Somebody had to pay it, and they paid it with their life. But I'm thankful that these million plus that Debbie was talking about, I'm thankful that in all of these generations, there have been those people who have said that the United States of America is a nation worth dying for. I'm thankful that they have chosen to win that freedom, preserve that freedom, and to continue to allow us to walk and worship in freedom. I don't know if you realize that our nation is not perfect, but we are a blessed people. For we gather here today without fear of persecution. We had the freedom to come and to worship in this house of worship, and that is a blessing. Many millions, billions of people across this world would love to have the privilege you have this morning of coming to worship freely as they would choose, and that's because somebody paid a price to give us that freedom, and we need to cherish that freedom and protect that freedom and remember how that freedom was won. We need to do that, and that's what Memorial Day helps us to do, to remember those who paid the price. Now, in all of those things, I'm thankful for our freedom, amen? I'm thankful for our country, and I pray for our nation. I pray for our nation. I pray for our leaders, and I pray for God to send a revival. But I hope and pray that, that your loyalty and that your excitement is not only because you are a citizen of the United States of America, but I hope that you'd be excited because you're a citizen of heaven. Amen? I hope that you have become a citizen of heaven because you gave your heart and your life to Jesus. That you realize that He loved you enough to die on the cross to pay the price for your sin, and you've asked Him to forgive you of your sin and to be Lord and Savior of your life. I, I, I hope that you understand how blessed you are that, that there was a group of apostles, and not only apostles, in every generation, even in this day, my friend, there are people who die for their faith. Every generation, people have died for their faith. Be thankful that somebody cared about you enough that they shared with you the gospel. And my prayer is that you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that not only that, that you'd take advantage that you have and the freedom we enjoy. Tell somebody else about Jesus Christ and how they can have a relationship with Jesus. And to remember to cherish the freedoms that we have in this country. Protect those freedoms we have and that we would live to be the nation that God wants us to be. I truly believe God wants to call us back to be that nation He has ordained for us to be and for us to use all the blessings and all the freedom that He gives to us to impact the world that needs to hear about the love of Christ. But it all starts 
in your heart and in your life. And where do you stand with Jesus? He said, you're worth dying for. Have you given your heart to Him? Have you given your life to Him? I hope and pray that you have. Most important decision you'll ever make. Let's pray together. Father, I thank You. I thank You for the truth. The truth that we are a blessed people. The truth that we are blessed because Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for our sin. The truth that we're blessed because those apostles were faithful to tell. And throughout the generations, somebody's been faithful to tell all the way to where we were able to hear, thank you, we have been blessed. Now, Father, I pray for that person who's never given their heart to Jesus, that today would be the day they'd say, yes, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. And they'd commit their life to Him in an intimate, personal way. Give their life to Jesus. That they'll know that they've been forgiven of their sin. And they know they have a home in heaven. And they know that Jesus died for them. For that person who needs that decision and needs to make that decision, Lord, give them the courage to step out in this invitation time and come forward and say, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to confess my faith in Christ. (coughs) Maybe there's a person here, Father, who needs to come and join this fellowship be a part of the Parker family, and you've spoken to them, your Holy Spirit has directed them, and that they know in their heart this is where you want them to be. I pray to give them the uh, courage to step out this morning and just come and say, boy, I want to be a part of what God's doing here in this place. You lead and you direct them by your Spirit. And God, we pray together for our country, and we pray that we will be one nation under God, and that we'll remember how we were formed and the heart of our forefathers, and that we'll live out that, and that, Father, we'll care about our nation, we'll pray for our nation, and that today and tomorrow we will remember those who paid the ultimate price and say thank you. Have your will and your way in this invitation. Give people the opportunity to respond.